Are you guys wondering how the Storm Audio ISP MK2 24 channel processor did in our bench test results? That's what we're gonna be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasella with Audioholics. We are back talking about the Storm Audio ISP MK2 this 24 channel processor. I got this unit in about a year ago at the old house to start testing it, knowing that I was building the Audioholic Smart House, which we're in right now, knowing I was gonna be building a very sophisticated home theater room using the RBH SVTRS system, as you can see here, and having this integrated into my rack, doing full digital connection between the Storm Audio processor and the Marani DSP because I have a fully active speaker system. So this is a very unique product. There's, there's maybe one other product, maybe the Trinov on the market that gives you digital outputs and, and, and analog outputs. So it allows me to connect to my active speakers without doing an additional um, D to A and A to D conversion. Don't have to do any of that stuff. I could go direct digital out into my Marani and then the Marani does the FIR filters and all the processing for the speakers and it does the analog conversion there at the amplifier. So this is a huge advantage for anyone that's running active speakers. I put together a test report. I wanna go over the results with you now and I'm gonna share my screen. Before we go over these results, it's very important for me to stress the fact that much of the stuff that I'll be showing you in this report, although it's measurable, it's not audible. I just wanna make that very clear so people understand that. So the first thing we did was I have an Audio Precision APX 585 eight channel HDMI analyzer. That's how I do all my measurements on all amplifiers and all receivers and all processors. The first thing we wanted to look at is frequency response. Now you can see here that even with a high res signal, uh, 192 kilohertz, 24 bit signal, the Storm Audio uh, basically down converts everything to 48 kilohertz sampling rate. Now the interesting thing about that is it's pretty much a brick wall filter at around 22K. So they're doing some additional processing that's really bringing it down to, uh, to 22 kilohertz uh, bandwidth. Now, I know people that are purists that say, hey, I wanna have full bandwidth. I wanna be able to be uh, take advantage of the high resolution audio. So I should have a sampling rate higher than that to be native. The reality of the situation is, first of all, nobody can hear really above 20 kilohertz, especially when you're, my age or older, or my young youth and older, um, you just don't hear above 20K anymore. Um, the other thing too, is if you're doing any type of bass management or you're doing any type of room correction, like DRAC, for example, DRAC down converts everything to 48 kilohertz anyway. Uh, most of the room correction systems do that as well. But that being said, it would have been nice if they had a true bypass that would have allowed a higher sampling rate. But suffice to say, the, the filter response is really good here. Uh, there is some out of band noise at around 30 kilohertz, but it's not something that you're gonna have to worry about. It's you know pretty low, down about 65 dB. The next thing I wanted to do was talk about uh, the bass management. There, um, the Storm Audio, I did a video on this already. It has the most advanced bass management system we've ever seen. You could do so much different uh, bass configurations, summing bass LFE uh, to different speaker zones. You could actually have bass go from one speaker to an adjacent speaker in that group if you wanted to. Let's say you have a height channel that only goes down to 100 hertz. You can cross over that bass to the next speaker near the group, which would be a side channel and have the bass go there. Or you could have it go to the subwoofers, you could do a mono mix. There's just so many um, so many options you can do here that's really quite incredible. Um, the one thing I did notice though, there is some out of band noise here at 50 kilohertz uh, with the bass management engaged. Again, it's down you know, about minus 55 dB. I showed Storm Audio some of these measurements and they are actually addressing this in a DAC upgrade coming next year. Um, they've actually done a lot. They've been very proactive with my findings and, and uh, making tweaks to the processor. That's why it took me this long to do a test report because I've been going back and forth with them. So anyways, when you look really closely um, at the distortion versus frequency response, 
this is some interesting stuff here now because they're doing such a sharp roll off at 22k you did get you do get some higher distortion residuals you know about near the brick wall response about five to ten kilohertz but again this is at 0 0.05 percent thd you don't normally see magazines give you these kind of detail of measurements but i wanted to bring this to you because you know it is an expensive processor and we are audioholics and we want to take things to the volume 11 basically so i'm not happy about this distortion here it's not audible but i'm still not happy for a product that costs this much this should be cleaner and in fact it will be cleaner when they do the dac upgrade but sit tight because it's not all bad when you look at this i know it's not state-of-the-art and distortion but i've never heard any distortion coming out of this thing um the fact that this processor is so configurable and has so much upgrade growth to it, it's I tend to overlook stuff like this, especially if it's not an audibility thing. So I, I went and I did sign ad results here. I know Audio Science Review does this in their measurements and I wanted to kind of incorporate something like that. So if somebody is looking at hit their reviews versus our reviews, they have something to compare to. And you could see this, this did really well, depending on what channel I tested. We see anywhere between 91 to 97 dB, and that's you know across from one volt all the way to its max output. Now it's important to note that I was unable to clip this preamp. Um, I just when I put a zero dB FS signal in and I turned the volume all the way up, I just basically it stopped getting louder at uh, nine volts. It didn't clip. So this thing has plenty of drive, and it's really you know overall it's pretty clean here. I'm pretty happy with this sign ad result. That's that's a good result. So over here, I, I wanted to show you some FFTs with a one kilohertz signal. I like to look at the out of band noise and see what's going on here. And again, this is at eight volts. So you're never gonna drive this thing at eight volts. Usually you're gonna drive a preamp at around two volts RMS to get full output to your amplifier. Again, this is four times that. The residuals are there, but they're not too bad. They're in the like minus 90s over here. So I didn't see any problem with this. I think it's a pretty good result here. I did do a square wave response, even though we don't hear square waves. I know people like to see that. And because of all the, the DSP noise shaping that they're doing in this processor, there's overshoot and undershoot here. So a perfect square wave wouldn't have this ringing that's here. Again, probably not audible, but it's just, you know, housekeeping. So here's where Storm made some pretty significant um, improvements since I got the processor. Part of the delay of, of me doing this review was when I measured signal to noise ratio uh, out of the analog outputs, it was only about 100 dB um, under this test condition with a zero dB FS input and a two volt output. That's not state of the art. I mean, it could be a lot better than that. I've seen receivers give me better results. So I went to Storm and basically what they did was they upgraded the firmware. So if you're using the analog outputs, you disable the digital output on those channels and you get a much better SNR, you get a 10 dB improvement. And that's exactly what I'm doing in my setup because I have the front three speakers that are fully digital, fully active. So I use the digital outputs on those and then all the other channels, I use the analog mode. So I switch it to analog mode and you can see the results here are very good, 110 dB SNR. Um, I never hear any hissing out of this thing. And I've got pretty high sensitivity speakers. All of my speakers in the uh, theater room are about 90 dB at one, one meter, 2.83 volts. And I don't hear any um, audible hissing from the speakers, even a few feet away. So it's a quiet processor. So then we have the crosstalk. I did channel to channel crosstalk and it's excellent results, minus 75 dB at 20K. I like to see, uh, you know, at least 60 dB at 20K. So this is very good channel to channel isolation here. You know, it's like 100 dB at one kilohertz. So not a problem there. So I wanted to go over the base management, just like I was talking to about before, there's so many different options for base management. Watch our video, I'll put it as a playlist in here. You could check out the video and you could see why I'm so excited about all the different options you can do. If you just want a regular THX crossover response, use a second order Butterworth high pass and a fourth order Linkwitz Riley on the subs. Um, that's exactly what I did here and that's exactly the response I got. THX mode right here, even though it doesn't say THX, it meets that requirement exactly. These filters are dead accurate. 
So then I did uh, expert-based management, and that's when I started running into different combinations of, of how you would do your crossovers and how you would route your base. And everything worked as indicated. So I ran different crossover settings for the high pass on different channels, as you can see here. And they're all really accurate to the filter responses that were expected um, and the subwoofer response as well. So there's different modes of settings. There's large width sub, large end sub. Um, I don't recommend using the large width sub because it's kind of acts like it kind of acts like a small speaker at that point. It does base manage the speaker that's large. So I don't fully understand that configuration. I use large and sub if you want your speakers to be large and you want space going to your subwoofers. You can even route LFE to your speakers if, if they're base capable. I do not recommend this for 98% of speakers. In my case, because I have huge RBH towers with 412s in each tower, those get the LFE. And as you can see here, everything is really precise. So. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about on, on the Storm processor is I did a lot of PEQ manipulation for bass. I went into the processor and I dialed in the bass. I got rid of you know room modes. Let's say there was a big peak at 35 hertz. I was able to go and adjust the cue of that, adjust the shape of it, and, and cut it down. The one really cool thing, because this is like kind of like a processor that's computer driven as opposed to, you know, DSP chips in, in other processors like the Japanese receivers. This thing has so much horsepower and bandwidth to it. So every filter I put was dead accurate. The PEQ filters, when I set the center frequency, it was dead accurate. As opposed to some of the uh, receivers like the Yamahas, for example, when I set PEQ filters, they were never that precise. There were always a few hertz off or the, the Q was a little off. It just was not as precise as this. That's a huge advantage. If you want to go in like a surgeon and really kind of fine tune things, the Storm Audio processor allows you to do that. And it's just, it's so far I've been really happy with this processor. I mean, it looks great. It's, it performs really well. Yes, there's some things in the measurements that I'd like to see improved, but they are addressing it with a future DAC upgrade. I think that's great. The base management flexibility is just superb. I mean, it really makes or breaks my system. I couldn't do what I'm doing in my theater room with a conventional receiver or a conventional processor. And there's only two processors on the market that I know of that have digital outputs. It's the Storm and the Trinov. They're both incredibly good processors. They both have their associated strengths and weaknesses. I'm focusing here on the Storm. I'm going to be supporting this platform for the years to come. Um, it's the centerpiece in our theater room. And I'll be doing more of a formal uh, review in the future. I'll give you my listening impressions and I'll give you uh, my impressions on its operation. Um, this is not an easy processor to configure for the layman. You really need a pro installer to come and do this for you. Um, it's not for the general public, generally speaking. But that said, it's really easy to navigate um, using it with your, with your phone. The remote control on it is excellent, and I will be doing a separate video on that. So why don't you guys let me know what processor are you using or are you considering? What do you think about the Storm processor? Do you see yourself maybe getting a processor like this in the future? They have different configuration options. You could go from 16 channels all the way up to 32 channels, analog or digital. I mean, there's just a lot of different um, configuration options for a product like this. Don't forget to hit our subscribe button, hit the thumbs up. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. You get direct access to me if you want to ask questions, if you want to suggest video topics. Of course, we always appreciate your support on our Patreon, and I hope you found this video useful. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.